So, um, as I said, we are going to be presenting um, the work we've been doing for the North and the Sea Project, uh, focusing a little bit on the methodology that we've been uh, applying, um, and some results from EGG, and also some wider implications of the, the general sort of mapping work that we've been doing as part of, of this project. Um, so, first of all, then, um, what did we set out to do when we applied um, for this funding? So, we have two overall aims. Um, the first one is to identify and investigate key harbours and uh, landing sites um, as part of Viking Age and, and North Scotland, and then to sort of zoom out from these places and looking at the wider uh, networks and communication patterns that we can see uh, within Scandinavian Scotland. Um, and in order to study this, you know, <laughs> this is like a massive project, um, and we're mainly focusing on, on the west coast of Scotland, um, and we're applying an interdisciplinary approach, uh, where we're sort of using archaeological evidence, written sources, not so many of those, uh, and toponymic evidence, which is proving to be, you know, really, really important. Um, and when we designed the project, we were above all then inspired uh, by this concept called maritime cultural landscape, which is designed by um, the archaeologist Christa Vesterdal. Uh, and it's a really, really useful uh, concept for studying sort of any time period um, of, um, of coastal use. And I have the, the definition up here. I don't know if you can read it, but I'll read it to you. Um, so the definition is the whole network of sailing routes, old as well as new, with ports and harbours along the coast, and its related constructions and remains of human activity underwater as well as terrestrial. So I'll come back to this uh, in, the, in the next few slides. Um, but this framework then uh, was developed over a number of years by, by Christopher Estadol, and uh, his work was mainly then in the Bothnia and, and Baltic area. And he, apart from the method then that he developed, he also applied it to this area. And then other um, archaeologists, uh, for example, Sven Kalmring, who is part of our project, has also applied this um, to Germany um, and Scandinavia, and others have also used it in the North Atlantic. But it's never been used uh, for Scotland. And we thought this is a really, really good starting point uh, for us. So we've taken um, this concept and we're combining it with um, archaeological fieldwork field and um, a lot of geophysics. Um, and we're um, looking at sort of the West Coast as a whole and then we're trying, using this to try and find key locations that we then um, go to uh, the site visits and we select sites for um, um, archaeological uh, fieldwork. So um, this is a, a sort of quick summary then of uh, Vestadal's uh, concept, um, and he listed then five types of sources that he was using to study the maritime landscape. So we've got then shipwrecks, uh, remains on land, traditional usage, study of the natural topography, and maritime place names. And you see ship, ship, shipwrecks is sort of grayed out here. And the reason is that this is something that we're really not focusing on. We're much more concerned with actual sort of coastal uh, use. Um, and in terms of, of land remains, um, we've got you know, inland settlements, um, seasonal habitation sites, huts, for example, net drying stands, burial mounds, churchyard markings. It's, the list is long. Beacons is one thing that's come up a lot, and we're focusing quite a lot on, on beacon sites. So this is the list that Vestadol uh, put together. Um, and then another really important part of this is that mental mapping, so based on um, existence of landing sites and routes, uh, winds and currents, and these oral traditions that are passed around between people using the coast on how best uh, to travel. So route systems and um, places where you might need uh, guides or, or pilots as well. And uh, thinking a bit more about their natural topography and, and place names, again, uh, really, really important aspect. Um, there was a, a big uh, project a few years ago um, um, funded 
by European funding and run from Germany, Natasha Mailer and, and others. And it was called the, the, uh, the Harbour Project. Um, and they started in the Viking Age and, and went um, later on in time as well. And as part of their study of harbours, they identified a number of, of different types of harbour sites and landing sites. Uh, landing sites basically have very little archaeological remains, but harbours you can find structures. Um, so we're mainly looking at, at landing sites rather than expecting you know, big harbours with... Uh, constructed features. But this diagram here shows, you know, really what um, the, the different types of harbors and landing sites that they identified as part of this project. Um, maritime place names, as I said, uh, really, really uh, important for us. So we are uh, identifying uh, Norse place names um, that some, a lot of the time they're known from Scandinavia that indicate uh, different types of coastal use um, and, uh, of course, it's particularly tricky for the, the West Coast because a lot of those names have then gone into Gaelic as well. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of teasing out um, of here. But it's proving really, really useful, and we're finding some really interesting place names, and it's, it's telling us a lot about coastal use um, in, the, in the Scandinavian period and also um, later on. So if we just uh, move away a little bit from the particular sites then, uh, we're also looking at, at travel, um, so we can think about long distance travel then, uh, if we think about Scotland uh, as a place, Scandinavian Scotland as a place right between Ireland and Scandinavia, uh, and people are then travelling um, between these areas. Um, and sort of, you can sort of do an island hopping, for example, from going from Ireland across the west coast, uh, Orkney and Shetland, and then across to Scandinavia. And of course, in the past, when looking at um, settlement of uh, in Scotland and the Viking activity, it's always seen that um, people came from, you know, mainly Norway, and then sort of came across to Orkney and Shetland, and then moved further along the coast. Um, and there's been this search for the earliest um, settlement evidence in Orkney and Shetland. And it's, you know, it's difficult to get earlier than 850, uh, really. Um, so David Griffiths recently presented uh, an, an article with, with a different theory saying that maybe um, they came the other way. Maybe, you know, people, Scandinavians came round, um, settled in Ireland, raided in Ireland, and then um, moved up the West Coast and, and to sort of Orkney and Shetland. Um, so he's... And I'm not saying it goes otherwise, but it's good to think about these different patterns of, of movement. Um, and then, of course, for us, thinking, where are the stopping points? Where did they settle? Where did they bury people? And, and what sites were used for, you know, maybe beach markets, etc. And how do you travel? Um, and then these mental maps become really important, uh, using perhaps local guides, uh, pilots, etc. Um, and then within that, then short distance travel uh, between islands, um, and how, how do you uh, navigate that? And how do you learn um, when is good to travel? You know, tides really you know important to bear in mind, for example. So to think about the, the mental mapping, uh, we've been sort of, of course, looking at really important uh, place names. Um, and there are some descriptions in Old Norse sources of, of routes, and it tells us how um, people were really thinking about um, travel um, and passing on stories about currents, winds, uh, and what to look out for on, on the journey. Um, Old Norse place names are very descriptive. Um, Lerwick, um, Kirkwall, for example, Church Bay, Muddy Bay. So, you know, sort of signifying, of course, that's quite natural to have place names like that, but it's also useful when traveling because you also know what you're looking out for. Um, Hoy is a really good example. Uh, it, it means the high island, and it's definitely in Orkney is the highest island. And here um, I've got um, an example from a map, uh, Murdoch Mackenzie uh, from the 18th century. And you know, he produced a huge number of maps and hydro hydrological charts uh, for large parts of Scotland. And of course, this is really useful for us because they are thinking uh, about how to travel with non-motorized craft. Um, so it's quite, and, and for us, we need to sort of stop thinking about going with <laughs> ferries, for example. How do you travel on a sailing boat? Um, 
um, and, you know, quite old-fashioned uh, boats compared to today as well. Um, and um, so part of these maps are really useful, and they also show outlines of islands from different directions, so that when you're approaching Hoi then, for example, here from a particular um, direction, it will look like this. So that's another way of thinking how these mental maps are worked. Um, also, um, thinking about key place names that will um, tell people where to go or when they had arrived at a particular place. Um, this is when we were visiting Collinsey a few months ago and we were arriving on the ferry. Um, and here we've got, um, this is a Gallic place name, but the, you know, it means the, the fair of the White Beach. And I was on the ferry and the, this picture, unfortunately, doesn't really capture what it looked like. But when we, so the sun came out and we were approaching Collinsey and the, this beach here, uh, the white beach really shone. It was so, so bright from there. I thought, if I was looking for a place to land and I came with them a bit, I would go there. It was, it was incredible. Um, so it just shows us how these place names can be really important um, um, when, uh, when approaching um, islands. Also, maybe there are key place names that are, act as warning signs. You know, don't go here. This place is really dangerous. Uh, and we've got, uh, for example, then in the Pentland Firth, which, of course, is a really, really tricky area between uh, the mainland and, and uh, Orkney and is really, really famous for being difficult to travel. But here there's a, a really massive um, whirlpool um, and it comes from the Old Norse, then it's called the, the Swelke, but it comes from the Swallower um, because probably, you know, that, you know, boats can be um, sunk there. And it's right by the island of Stroma, which means current island. So this, you know, this is a difficult place. And um, they have a similar example then um, from Dura Sound as well. And both of these whirlpools have stories connected to them uh, with, related to mythology. Um, so we're thinking that, you know, these probably form part of, of these journeys as well. So finally, I will just um, tell you a little bit about what we did, uh, did on, on Egg, and we have more fieldwork coming up pretty soon as well. Um, so we went to, to Egg um, for various reasons. First of all, because um, there's finally this um, very incredible um, stem post, or there's two actually, but this is one of them, um, and it's been dated um, 885 to 1035 from the radiocarbon dates. Um, and of course, it's uh, you know in a key position in th terms of thinking how people travelled uh, along the coast and in terms of Norse settlement as well. Um, so we did apply um, our methodology in working with particularly Andrew Jennings on our project uh, with the Gaelic place names, um, and um, this is then the Bay of Lag, which is really the most, the the best landing site um, on the island. Um, and there are some really, really interesting place names here. Lag then uh, comes from um, from Hlad, uh, so it's a, it's, a it's a landing place or a, and a loading bay probably. Um, and then we have so we have the place landing place, um, and we also have a, an island name um, and the tongue of the landing place. Um, so we're really focusing in and, and, and trying to pinpoint the area where to where, where to excavate. Um, it was difficult uh, because the find or the find spot was very, very vague. Uh, from the, found, found in the 19th century, uh, but it's been suggested then that there's a big um, sort of um, leak in. So you've got the beach, which is meant to be like a landing place, and then maybe pulling the boats up uh, into this lake, and perhaps that was a boat repair yard. That's been suggested. Um, so this is where we're going for, but you know this area is absolutely massive. Um, there's also been some later finds of wood there, but nobody could quite pinpoint where they were. Um, so we did go with geophysics uh, across the site, and we had a number of test trenches. Um, we did find some wood, uh, but on the very, very last morning. Um, so we saw it in the ground, and, and then we had to leave. So we're not quite sure what it was, but we, we've got some bits and pieces uh, that we might um, send off for, for radiocarbon dating. Um, and I'm nearly done, Shane. Um, but I wanted to show you as well um, the results of the geophysics. So this is the whole area that we covered with geophysics. Um, and um, we, we tried different methods. And in, in the end, we tried to, first of all, do a wide landscape study to see if we can reconstruct the water levels and also pinpoint other finds. Um, and we're still um, analyzing this data. So it's a bit difficult to 
um, um, to know exactly what we saw, but the, this idea of, of a lick sort of inland or just behind from the beach may not hold up, and it may well be that it is instead this a bit of it's a discharge channel coming out, and perhaps the beach was actually the, the landing place rather than having this this um, big piece of water behind the beach. Um, we'll, we'll see, we'll have to come back to that, but at the moment uh, we're, we're struggling to, to really find the idea that, that that's been modelled. Um, but we're still analysing and we've got um, some um, uh, wood to send off and some um, samples from um, core coring that we've done as well. So I'll hand over to you Shane. Thank you. All right, I've, we're now moving on to the highly <laughs> speculative part of <laughs> the talk. Um, Obviously, egg was a very clearly a good place to go because of the stem posts. Um, but Western Scotland is very big and it has lots of beaches. So how do you narrow it down in terms of future research? Where should we go next? So that's the kind of that's what I'm going to be looking at for the final 10 minutes. Burial sites. One thing we do know quite a bit about from the Viking Age for Scotland are where the burial sites are because they keep finding them. Um, and the ones on the map here, all those green dots, some of those are cemeteries, some of those are just individual sites. Um, they're all the burial sites where we've got a pretty good idea of where they are. Either, either you know, we know exactly where it is or within, say, 100 or so metres. So the ones that we've got good record for. There's many more burials that have been discovered that we don't know really where they are. And, you know, they might just say a burial on St Kilda or Tyree and we've got no idea whereabouts. So these dots are just the ones that, we've, um, that are locatable. And just going to the west coast now, um, the reason for focusing on the burials is that burials are probably associated with settlements Settlements are places that people have migrated to, as well as already being there, but presumably the Scandinavian element is migrating um, there, at least some of the population. And they're also places where you need communication. You need to be able to move around for trade and get food supplies and whatever else. So, and in the Viking Age, of course, communication is by water. So if you've got a settlement, it's got to be somewhere you can get to by a boat, generally speaking, especially in a coastal environment like Western Scotland. And a nice example of that is in the foreground, you've got that um, stone setting, which is actually, if you saw it from the air, it's the, um, the shape of a ship or a boat. This is on the Ardnamurchan Peninsula, it was found 2013, maybe somewhere around there, not too long ago. And as you can see, it is very close to the beach there. And this one is really good because this is actually a boat burial. So we know that on at least one occasion, they were able to get a boat to this location. And we would assume that getting boats to this location happened more than just on that one um, occasion for the burial. And if you have a look, of that site where the flag is there from um, the air. You can see the beach there, and also you've got that nice kind of peninsula-shaped island sticking out, which, mean, which helps to shelter that beach. So it is quite a good place to bring your boat. So yeah, burials is one kind of clue that we're looking at in terms of where people were and how they got there. And then once we find these sites, we, um, we're looking at other bits of archaeology um, around them. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with past map, but I've been spending hundreds of hours going through past map, going up and down the Scottish uh, west coast. So this site here is on Barra. It is um, Borv, I think. Uh, which is a Scandinavian place name, meaning fort. And you've got the fort is over here. You've got a Viking burial here. You've obviously got a very nice beach up here and a slightly not quite as good, but still accessible one there. Over here is an early monastic site. So looking for evidence, 
both pre and also post Viking Age into the Norse period and later because um, some of our best landing sites for the Viking Age are going to be underneath current harbours because you know, what was a great place to land in the Viking Age stays a great place over the centuries. Obviously, we can't go and dig up a um, current harbour, um, although with current ferry timetables, maybe they're not being used as often as they used to be. Um, so we've got to find the other, the other ones that didn't develop into, you know, fishing ports and ferry terminals and things like that. So, yeah, yeah this is, yeah, so lots of different sites, but also the place names are another important aspect of that particular site. And we're very fortunate on the project to have the uh, world's leading expert on Viking assembly sites <laughs> sitting here. So we have this map of um, Viking and Norse assembly sites. You can see there's, again, there's quite a few on the west coast, there's far more on the north coast, which is very common and fairly frustrating for the Viking Age, is that there's so much evidence for Orkney and Shetland, there's not as much for the west coast, even though we know that they're in the west coast, you know, just as much as they're in the, up in the Northern Isles, which is part of the reason why we're focusing in on the west coast, to try to bridge that gap a little bit. But yeah, all of these assembly sites, these are also places that you had to get to in order to attend the assembly. and as you can see, they are coastal, so they're sites that you're getting to, you know, some people won't be travelling overland, but a lot of people are going to be getting to these places by boat. So it's part of the nautical um, environment. And Alex mentioned uh, beacons. I've been spending lots of time looking at beacons, but... Um, one area which has been mentioned by McGregor in his book on, I can't remember what the title is, or something wonderful and romantic in early 20th century, The Elfin Isle of Sky or something along like that. Um, anyway, he, he talks about these, a beacon down here and how from that one you can see that one and from there you can see this and that it's an early warning system. He doesn't say when these beacons were in use. Obviously, it's part of the... Um, cultural memory that still existed when he visited there and was speaking to people in 1920, in, yeah, around 1921, I think he was there. Um, so this is a nice example of a kind of network of sites. So they're not necessarily landing places, but they're showing us where, um, where people are approaching by water. And if it's the wrong clan or um, the bunch of Vikings, perhaps, you light your warning beacon to um, let people know. So, yeah, I've been, we've, currently we've been mapping the West Coast for um, beacon and watching sites. And my final slide that we've been looking at to get, uh, bring it up to 20th century, 21st century, is looking at fetch analysis, because... Um, so on this map here, uh, produced by Marine Scotland, very useful to give a kind of overview. The darker the red, the better it is. Uh, yeah, the better it is for landing. The more the more sheltered it is, basically. And um, so yeah, that that obviously can point us. I mean, and and you can zoom in on that and get better resolution on some of those. Um, islands like around Tyree at the moment there on this map where's Tyree down here it doesn't look like there's any landing places you know in any sheltered places at all but if you zoomed in on that um, using um, going onto the Marine Scotland website you'll find that there are a couple of you know vaguely orange bits where you could land uh, something that we discovered as well when we were on um, Colin Sea as we went and looked at Killeran Bay, famous Viking boat burial, one of the most magnificent beaches. I mean, I'm, I'm from Australia and I was impressed by this beach. It is really very impressive, even though you might, you might never actually be warm enough to swim in it. Um, so it, it looked great. Like when you see a map of Killeran Bay, 
it just looks like this magnificent place or a photograph that you would definitely, of, of course there's a Viking you know, boat burial there, you would want to, this is exactly the kind of place where you would take your boat. But actually when we were there, there were these massive waves crashing just off the coast and um, made us realise that you might be able to get your boat in, but it's going to be very difficult to get your boat back out of this particular um, location. So uh, sometimes even with lovely things like fetch analysis, you still need to actually visit these sites to get a real understanding of how they're going to work. And that is the end of our presentation. Um, exactly one minute early, which is perfect for the timing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>